Chapter Twenty One of Joan Thursday by Louis Joseph Vance. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Mamperard. A little after the hour of four on Monday afternoon, Joan emerged from that riotous meander of hideous wooden galleries, ramps, passages, sheds, and vast echoing caves of gloom which in those days encumbered the site of the new grand central station and with a long breath of relief turned westward on forty-second street she walked slowly and without definite aim yet she had never felt so keenly the quickness and joy of being alive her idle fancy invested with a true if formless symbolism her escape from that amazing labyrinth of shadows to the clear sweet sunlight of the clamorous busy street as if she had eluded and cast off convention and formality the constraint of a settled future and the strain of aspirations to be other than as nature had fashioned her and was free again of the enchanting ease of being simply herself she had within five minutes said good-bye to her betrothed her lips were yet warm with her parting kiss her eyes still moist and so the more bewitching with the facile tears through which she had watched his train draw out of the station he was not to be back within a month more probably his return would not occur within five or six weeks she was contrarily possessed by two opposed humours one approximately saturated with an exquisite melancholy and a sense of heroic emotions adequately experienced and the other of freedom untrammelled by restrictions of any sort overruling her faint-hearted protests matthias had left her the sum of six weeks wages or allowance in advance by way of provision against emergencies and delays joan had this magnificent sum of one hundred and fifty dollars intact in her pocket-book more money than she had ever at least seriously dreamed of possessing at one time temporarily it represented to her imagination level-headed as she ordinarily was in consideration of money matters wealth almost incalculable it thrilled her tremendously to contemplate this tangible proof of her lover's unquestioning trust and generosity and at the same time it irked her with gnawing doubts of her worthiness for continually the knowledge skulked in the dark backwards of her consciousness that only lack of opportunity restrained her from active disloyalty to his prejudices though she had disguised it from him and even in some measure from herself she knew that love had not quenched but had quickened her ambition for the stage to be desired by one man only stimulated her longing to be desired inaccessibly beyond the impregnable barrier of footlights by all men she wondered how far her strength and constancy would serve her to resist where opportunity to come her way during the absence of matthias when distance should have sapped the strength of his influence and loneliness had lent an accent to her need for occupation and companionship furtively she closed her left hand until she could feel the diamond in his ring turned in toward the palm beneath her glove as if it were a talisman turning north on broadway she breasted the full current of the late afternoon promenade where the subway kiosks encroach upon the sidewalk in front of what had been shaman's restaurant there was a distinct congestion of footfares joan was obliged to move more slowly crowded from behind close on the heels of those in front elbowed by pedestrians bound the opposite way abruptly she caught sight of wilbrow approaching almost at the same instant he saw her momentarily his eyes clouded with an effort of memory then he placed her his lantern cheeks widened with an ironic grin and he lifted his hat with elaborate ceremony joan flushed slightly smiled brightly in response and tossed her head with a spirited suggestion of good-humoured tolerance in another moment wondering why she had done this she realized that it had been due simply to a subconscious valuation of the man's interest in the event she should ever again decide to try her luck on the stage 
crossing forty-third street she turned again north on the sidewalk in front of a building given over almost entirely to the offices of theatrical businesses the sidewalk darkened the year round with groups of actors sociably resting one of these groups as joan drew near broke up on the urgent suggestion of a special policeman detailed for the purpose and a member of it swinging with a laugh to move on stopped short to escape collision with the girl then he laughed again in the friendliest fashion and offered his hand she looked up into the face of charlie quard well he cried heartily i always was a lucky guy i've been thinking about you all day wondering what had become of you joan smiled and shook hands i guess it wasn't worrying you much she retorted if you'd wanted to you knew where to find me quard needed no more encouragement promptly ranging alongside and falling into step that's just it he argued i knew where to start looking for you all right but i was kind of afraid you might be in when i called and i didn't know whether you'd snap my head off or not that's likely the girl countered amiably there was a distinctly agreeable sensation to be derived from this association with one upon whom she could impose her private estimate of herself what made you want to see me all of a sudden then you ain't sore on me what for she evaded transparently oh you know what for all right i'm sore enough on myself not to want to talk about it well said joan indifferently i guess it's none of my business if you're such a rummy you can't hold on to a job only of course i don't have to stand for that sort of foolishness more than once you said something then all right quard approved humbly i can't blame you for feeling that way about it but let me tell you an honest fact i ain't touched a drop of anything stronger in buttermilk since that night so help me claw on erlanger why well i guess i must have took a tumble to myself anyhow when i got over the cats and jammer thing i thought it all out and made up my mind it was up to me to behave for the balance of my sentence is that so joan asked pausing definitely on the corner of forty-fifth street i know i can quard asserted convincingly believe me joan i hate the stuff i'd as lief stake myself to a slug of sulfuric no on the level i'm booked for the water tank rope for the rest of my natural i'm awful glad observed the girl maliciously it's so nice for your mother well good afternoon hold on quard protested i'll walk down to the house with you no you won't she returned promptly why not i don't want you to oh you don't he murmured blankly pulling down the corners of his wide expressive mouth so sorry she parroted good afternoon she was several steps away before the man recovered from this rebuff then with a face of set intent he gave chase i say miss thursday joan accepted with a secret smile this sudden change from the off-hand manner of his first addresses miss thursday eh she said to herself but halted none the less well with self-evident surprise look here listen insisted quard i got to have a talk with you what about oh this is no good place when can i see you is it quite necessary mr quard he wagged an earnest head at her that's right what are you doing to-night oh i got an engagement with some friends of mine she said with spontaneous mendacity well then when oh i don't know you might as well take your chances call round some time in two or three days and i gotta be satisfied with that why not cord shook his head helplessly i'd like to know what's come over you why what's the matter the temptation to lead him on was irresistible you've changed a lot since i seen you last what you been doing to yourself she bridled maybe it's you that has changed maybe you're seeing things different now you're sober quard hesitated an instant his features drawn with anger then abruptly plenty he ejaculated 
and as if afraid to trust himself further turned and marched back to broadway smiling quietly joan made her way home on the whole the encounter had not been unenjoyable she had not only held her own she had condescended with striking success later she repented a little of her harshness she had been hardly kind if quard were sincere in his protestations of reform and a little tolerance might have earned her an evening less lonely it was spent after a dinner which proved unexpectedly desolate lacking the companionship to which of late she had grown accustomed in the back parlour to which matthias had left her the key and in discontented efforts to fix her interest on a novel before ten o'clock she gave it up and climbed to her room to lie awake for hours in mute rebellion against her friendless estate she might it was true have kept a promise made to her lover just before his departure to look up and renew relations with her family but the more she contemplated this step the less it attracted her inclination there would be another row with the old man most likely and anyway there was plenty of time besides they'd want money if they found out she had any and while a hundred and fifty was a lot there was no telling when she'd get more eventually she fell asleep while reviewing her meeting with quard and turning over her hazy impression that it wouldn't hurt her to be less standoffers with him next time in the morning she settled herself at her typewriter in a fine spirit of determination to keep her mind occupied with the work in hand and incidentally to rid her conscience of it until the feeling of loneliness wore off or at least till its reality became a trifle less unpalatable through familiarity but not two pages had been typed before the call of the sunlit september day proved seductive beyond her will to resist a much advertised promenade de toilette at a department store claimed the rest of the morning and after lunch she took in a moving picture show but again her evening was forlorn theatres allured but she hardly liked to go alone in desperation she cast back mentally to the friends of the old days and after rejecting her erstwhile confidant and co-laborer at the stocking counter gussie ennis who lived too near home and would tell her father who would pass it along to the old man joan settled upon one or two girls resident in distant harlem to be hunted up treated to a musical comedy and regaled with the narrative of the rise and adventures of joan thursday until their lives were poisoned with corrosive envy but the first mail of wednesday furnished distraction so potent that this project was postponed indefinitely and passed out of joan's mind never to be revived it brought her two letters manufacturing an event of magnitude in the life of a young woman who had yet to write her first letter and who had thus far received only a few scrappy and incoherent notes from boyish admirers there was one from matthias posted in chicago the preceding morning her first love letter it was scanned hurriedly even impatiently and put aside in favor of a fat manila envelope whose contents consisted of a typewritten manuscript and a note in scrawling longhand friend joan i hope you are not still mad with me and sorry i got hot under the collar monday only i thought you might have been a little easy on me because i am strictly on the water wagon and this time meant it what i wanted to talk to you about was a sketch i got hold of a while ago you know you picked the other one only that was punk stuff compared with this i think please read this and tell me what you think about it if you like it i think i will try it out soon if it's any good it's a cinch to cop out orpheum time for a classy act like this your true friend charles h cord p s of course i mean i want you to act the woman's part if you like the sketch what do you think it was afternoon before she realized the flight of time she turned back to quard's note a trifle disappointed that he hadn't suggested an hour when he would call for her answer adjusting her hat before the mirror preparatory to going out to lunch she realized without a qualm that there was no longer any question of her intention 
as between Quard's offer and the wishes of matthias whatever the consequences she meant to play that part but on terms and conditions to be dictated by herself but in the act of drawing on her gloves she checked and for a long time stood fascinated by the beauty and lustre of the diamond on her left hand a stone of no impressive proportions but one of the purest and most excellent water of an exceptional brilliance it meant a great deal to one whose ingrained passion for such adornments had prior to her love affair perforce been satisfied with the cheap trashy and perishable stuff designated in those days by the term french novelty jewelry subconsciously she was sensitive to a feeling of kinship with the beautiful unimpressionable enigmatic stone as though their natures were somehow complementary actively she knew that she would forfeit much rather than part with that perfect and entrancing jewel with nothing else in nature animate or inert would it have been possible for her to spend long hours of silent worshipful sympathetic communion if she were to persist in the pursuit of her romantic ambition it might bring about a pass of cleavage between herself and her lover it was more than likely indeed she knew the prejudices of matthias to be as strong as his love and this last no stronger than his sense of honour tacitly if not explicitly she had given him to understand that she would respect his objections to a stage career he would not forgive unfaith least of all such a clandestine and stealthy disloyalty as she then contemplated the breaking of their engagement would involve the return of the diamond intolerable thought and yet staring wide-eyed into her mirror she saw herself irresolute at crossroads on the one hand matthias marriage the diamond a secure and honourable future on the other hand hoard the lie disloyalty the loss of the diamond uncertainty a vista of grim appalling hazards and yet she had four weeks probably six perhaps eight in which to weigh the possibilities of this tremendous and seductive adventure the lie might fail in that case matthias need never know End of chapter twenty one Chapter Twenty Two of Joan Thursday by Louis Joseph Vance. The Slippervox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. As she drew near to Longacre Square, Joan saw Ward detach himself from an area railing against which he had been lounging across the street and move over to intercept her since she had anticipated that he might waylay her in some such manner if he didn't call at the house she was not surprised by this manoeuvre but she was a little surprised and not a little amused if quite privately to see him throw away his cigar as they drew nearer and lift his hat such attentions from him were distinctly novel and gratifying complacent and at the same time excited beneath a placid demeanour she greeted him with a cool little nod he grinned broadly but nervously i was wondering if you wouldn't happen along soon is that so joan returned blandly mind my walking with you no the girl drawled of course if i'm in the way oh no i'm just looking for some place to lunch well i'm hungry myself why not let me set up the eats all right she assented indifferently fine where'll we go oh i don't know anywhere as you say well rector's is right handy that suits me quard affirmed promptly but joan's sidelong glance discovered a look of some discomfiture i guess you got my letter all right he pursued as they crossed to the sidewalk and of the new york theatre building oh yes joan replied evenly after a brief pause what'd you think of the piece oh the sketch why it seems very interesting of course joan added in a tone of depreciation 
i didn't have much time just glanced through it you know i felt pretty sure you'd like it oh yes i thought it quite interesting said the girl patronizingly she seemed unconscious of his quick questioning glance and quard withdrew temporarily into suspicious baffled silence in the pause they crossed forty-fourth street and entered the restaurant it was rather crowded at that hour but by good chance they found a table for two by one of the windows where a heavily mannered captain of waiters probably thinking he recognized her held a chair for joan and bowed her into it with an impressment that secretly delighted the girl and lent the last effect to quartz discomfiture please she said gravely as the actor with the captain suave but vigilant at his elbow knitted expressive eyebrows over the menu please order something very simple i hardly ever have much appetite so soon after breakfast i um how about a cocktail quard ventured relief manifest in his smoothing the brow i thought you oh for you i mean mine's iced tea i think said joan easily i would like a bronx and then while quard was distracted by the importance of his order she removed her gloves and with her hands in her lap hidden beneath the table slipped off the ring and put it away in her wrist bag looking about the room the while with a boldness which she could by no means have mustered a month earlier in such surroundings distressful of her cocktail when served for all her impudence in naming it she merely sipped it a little and let it stand the mystery of the change in her worked a trace of exasperation into quard's humour he eyed her narrowly with misgivings i guess he ain't lost much sleep since we blew up he hazarded abruptly whatever do you mean drawled joan you look and act as if you'd come into money since i saw you last perhaps i have she said with provoking reserve meaning mind my own business he inferred morosely well now what do you think i well i'd be sorry to think what some folks might he blundered joan's eyes flashed ominously suppose you quit worrying about me i guess i can take care of myself i guess you can he admitted heavily excuse me that's all right and so am i joan relented a little lied i have come into some money not much her gaze was as clear and straightforward as though her mouth had been the only authentic wellspring of veracity let it go at that that's right too his face cleared lightened let's go down to brass tacks how about that sketch didn't i say it seemed very interesting he nodded with impatience but you ain't said how my proposition strikes you that's what i want to know you haven't made me any proposition go on didn't you read my note sure i did but you only said you wanted me for the woman's part ain't that enough she shook her head with a pitying smile you got to talk regular business to me i ain't as easy as i was once i know the game better and i don't need a job so bad how much will you pay he hesitated named reluctantly a figure higher than that which he had had in mind thirty-five dollars nothing doing said joan promptly but look here you're only a beginner it's lovely weather we're having for september isn't it i'd offer you more if i could afford it but have you heard anything from maisie since she left town damn maisie how much do you want anyhow fifty and transportation on the road he checked whistled guardedly and incredulously changed his manner bending confidentially across the table listen girlie you know i'd do anything in the world for you fifty and transportation but i had to pay the guy what wrote this piece fifty for a month's option if i take it up i gotta slip him a hundred more and twenty-five a week royalty as long as we play it and there's three others in the cast outside of you and me david'll want 
fifty at least and the thief thirty-five and the servant twenty-five there's a hundred and thirty-five already including royalty add fifteen for tips and all that a hundred and fifty fifty to you two hundred the best i can hope to drag down is three and bosker will want ten per cent commission for booking us leaving only seventy from my bed and i'm risking all i got salted away to try it out he paused with an air of appeal to which joan was utterly cold it's a woman's piece she said tersely if you get a sure enough actress to play it she'll want a hundred at least if she's any good at all you're saving fifty if you get me at my price this was so indisputably true that ward was staggered and temporarily silenced and john grover argument shrewdly home with unblushing mendacity tom wilbrow says it's only a question of time before i can get any figure i want to ask in reason ward's eyes started tom wilbrow he gasped he rehearsed me in the jade god before rideout went broke i guess you heard about that the actor nodded moodily but i didn't know you was in the cast look here make it fifty or nothing after another moment of hesitation quard gave in with a surly all right at once to hide his resentment he attacked with more force than elegance the food before him joan permitted herself a furtive and superior smile the success of her tactics proved wonderfully exhilarating even more so than the prospect of receiving fifty dollars a week she would have accepted fifteen rather than lose the opportunity she had demonstrated clearly and to her own complete satisfaction her ability to manage men to bend them to her will there was ironic fatality in the accident which checked this tide of gratulate reflection from some point in the restaurant behind joan's back three men who had finished their lunch rose and filed toward the broadway entrance passing the girl one of these looked back curiously paused turned and retraced his steps as far as her table his voice of spirited suavity startled her from a waking dream of power tempered by policy ambitions and achieved through adulation of men why well, miss thursday how do you do flashing to face eyes of astonishment joan half started from her chair automatically thrust out a hand of welcome gasped mr marbridge quard looked up with a scowl marbridge ignored him having in a glance measured the man and relegated him to a negligible status he had joan's hand and the knowledge easily to be inferred from her alarm and hesitation that she remembered and understood the scene of last sunday and was at once flattered and frightened by that memory his handsome eyes ogled her effectively please don't rise i just caught sight of you and couldn't resist stopping to speak how are you i joan stammered I i'm very well thanks as if one look at you wouldn't have told me you were as healthy as happy more charming than both you are a eh, not lonesome his intimate smile the meaning flicker of his eyes toward quard exposed the innuendo oh no i venetia was saying only yesterday we ought to look you up she wants to call on you where do you put up in town almost unwillingly the girl gave her address knowing in her heart that the truth was not in this man and i presume you're ordinarily at home round four in the afternoon she nodded instinctively i'll not forget to tell venetia two eighty nine west forty fifth eh right oh i must trot along so glad to have run across you good afternoon regaining control of her flustered thoughts joan found quard eyeing her with odd intentness friend of yours he demanded with a sneer and a backward jerk of his head yes the husband of a friend of mine she replied quickly the actor digested this information grimly swell friends you got all right he commented not without a touch of envy now i begin to understand what's marbridge going to do for you 
do for me mr marbridge why nothing she answered blankly in a breath i don't know what you mean that's all right then but take a friendly tip and give him the office the minute he begins to talk about influencing managers to star you i've heard about that guy and he's a rotten proposition grab it from me he's arlington's silent partner and you know what kind of a rep arlington's got no i don't joan challenged him sharply once more i don't care anyway i don't see what arlington's reputation's got to do with my being a friend of marbridge's wife no more do i grumbled quard not if marbridge believes you are End of chapter twenty two Chapter twenty three of Joan Thursday by Lewis Joseph Vance. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Before leaving the restaurant, Quard outlined in detail his plans for producing the lie for vaudeville presentation. He named the other two actors, spoke of hiring a Negro dresser who would double as the servant, and indicated his intention of engaging a producing director of the first caliber who he said thought highly of the play joan was a little overcome peter gloucester was a producer quite worthy to be named in the same breath with wilbrow well he believes in the piece quard explained the same as me and he says he'll give us ten afternoon rehearsals for a hundred and fifty it'll be worth it you must think so said joan a little odd you bet i do this means a lot to me anyway i gotta do something to keep my head above out of town stock or the movies again mentioning his recent experience he shuddered realistically but if this piece ain't after proof i'm no judge gloucester says so too and to have him tune it up into a regular classy act will be worth something i tell you his hesitation was due to the fact that quard was secretly counting on the representations of his agent boskirk who insisted that properly presented the sketch would earn at least four hundred and fifty dollars a week instead of the sum he had named to joan but joan overlooked this lamely retrieved slip she was all preoccupied with a glowing sense of gratification growing out of this endorsement of her first surmise that quard had only waited on her consent to go ahead the thought was unctuous flattery to her conceit inflating it tremendously even in the face of a shrewd suspicion that it was sentiment more than an exaggerated conception of her ability that made quard reckon her cooperation indispensable that the man was infatuated with her she was quite convinced on the other hand she didn't believe him sufficiently blinded by passion to imperil the success of his venture by giving her the chief part unless he believed she could play it after proof or no listen girlie quark pursued after one meditative moment could you begin rehearsing to-morrow of course i could because if we don't we lose three days how well Quard explained with a sheepish grin. I guess I ain't any more nutty than the next actor you'll meet on Broadway, but I'd as leaf slip my bankroll to the waiter for a tip as starting anything on a Friday. And Saturday and Sunday's busy days for the jinx, too. I got too much up to wish anything mean on to this piece. At his suggestion, they left the dining room by the hotel entrance on 44th Street, and Joan waited in the lobby while quard telephoned gloucester it's all right he announced beaming as he emerged from the booth pete's ready to commence to-morrow afternoon now i got to hustle and round up the rest of the bunch where will it be asked joan don't know yet i'll phone you where in the morning at the latest hastening home joan plunged at once into the study of her part with a greater readiness since the occupation was an anodynous to an uneasy conscience though she was always what is known as a quick study this new role was a difficult one by far the longest and unquestionably the most important it comprised fully half the total number of sides in the manuscript 
nearly half as many again as were contained in quard's part the next in order of significance and her application that first day was hindered by a perplexing interruption in the early evening when a box was delivered to her containing a dozen magnificent red roses and nothing else neither a card nor a line of identification at first inclining to credit quard with this extravagance on second thought she remembered marbridge whom she felt instinctively to be quite capable of such overtures and her mind was largely distracted for the rest of the night by empty guesswork and futile attempts to decide whether or not she ought to run the risk of thanking quard when next they met eventually she made up her mind to let the sender furnish the clue and inasmuch as Quart never said anything which the most ready imagination could interpret as a reference to the offering she came in time to feel tolerably satisfied that the anonymous donor must have been marbridge it was to be long however before this surmise could be confirmed although on getting home saturday night after a hard day's work and a late dinner with quard she was informed that a gentleman had called and asked for her during the afternoon but had left neither word nor card the same thing happened on monday under like circumstances after which the attempts to see her were discontinued and then joan noticed that venetia didn't call interim the task of whipping the lie into shape went on so steadily that she had little leisure to waste wondering about marbridge or feeling flattered by his interest and she even ceased except at odd moments to regard quard as a man and therefore a possible conquest gloucester drilled the actors without mercy and spared himself as little a pursy body with the childish moonlike face of a born comedian he applied himself to the work with the extravagant solemnity of a minor poet mouthing his own perfumed verses at a literary dinner during rehearsals his manner was immitigably austere aloof inspired but however precious his methods he achieved brilliant effects in the despised medium of claptrap melodrama and under his tutelage even joan achieved surprising feats of emotional portrayal and this singularly enough without learning to despise him as she had despised wilbrow she learned that either wilbrow had lacked the time to teach her or she had then been unable to learn how to assume the requisite mood the moment she left the wings and drop it like a mask as soon as she came off stage again she was soon able to hate and fear quard with every fibre of her being throughout their long scenes of dialogue and to chat with him in unfeigned and amiability both before and after and her liking and admiration for the man deepened daily as gloucester deftly moulded quard's plastic talents into a rude but powerful impersonation partly because of the brevity of the little play which enabled them to run through it several times of an afternoon as soon as they were familiar with its lines and partly because gloucester was hard up and in a hurry to collect his fee the company was prepared well within the designated ten days and through the agent bostrick's influence they were favored with an early opportunity to present it at a professional tryout matinee a weekly feature of one of the better class moving picture and vaudeville houses the audiences attracted by such trial performances are the most singular imaginable in composition and of a temper the most difficult with the possible exceptions of a london first night house bent on booing whatever the merits of the offering and a body of jaded new york dramatic critics and apathetic theatre loungers assembled for the fourth consecutive first night of a week toward the end of a long hard winter on tuesday afternoons and nights as a rule they foregather in the combination houses of new york animated save for a sprinkling of agents and board managers by a single motive the desire to laugh preferably at but at a pinch with those attempting to win their approbation their sense of humor has been nourished on the sidewalk banana peel the slapstick and the patch on the southern exposure of the tramps trousers and while they will accept with the silence of curiosity if not of respect and at times even applaud straight legitimate acting 
the slightest slip or evidence of hesitation on the part of an actor the faintest suggestion of bathos in a line or even the tardy adjustment of one of the wings after the rise of the curtain will be hailed with shrieks of delight and derision before an assemblage of this character the distinguished romantic actor charles h quard and company presented the lie as the fifth number of a matinee bill waiting in the wings and watching the stagehands shift and manoeuvre flats and ceiling and arranged furniture and properties at the direction of the david who doubled that role with the duties of stage manager joan listened to the dreadful wails of a voiceless vocalist who on the other side of the scene drop was rendering with sublime disregard for key and tempo a ballad of sickening sentimentality heard the feet of the audience stamping in time drown out both song and accompaniment the subsequent roar of laughter and hand-clapping that signalized the retirement of the singer and experienced for the first and only time premonitory symptoms of stage fright through what seemed a wait of several minutes after the disappearance of the despised singer who half reeling half running with tears furrowing her enamelled cheeks brushed past joan on her way to her dressing-room the applause continued rising falling dying out and reviving in vain attempts to lure the object of its ridicule back to the footlights at a word from david the stagehands vanished and at his nod joan moved on david seated himself and opened a newspaper while the girl trembling took up a position near a property fireplace with an after-dinner coffee-cup and saucer in her hands she was looking her best in the evening frock purchased for the weekend at tanglewood and was in full command of her lines and business but there was a lump in her throat and a sickly sensation in the pit of her stomach as the chief orchestra took up the refrain of a time-worn melody which had been pressed into service as curtain music peering over the edge of his newspaper david spoke final words of kindly counsel don't you mind whatever happens make believe they ain't no audience the house was quiet now and the music very clear kneeling within the recess of the fireplace almost near enough to touch her hand quard begged plaintively for the love of god don't let their kidding queer you girlie remember foster promised he'd have martin beck out front joan nodded gulped the curtain rose through the glare of footlights the auditorium was vaguely revealed a vast and gloomy amphitheatre dotted with an infinite orderly multitude of round pink spots and still with the hush of expectancy joan thought of a dotted lavender foulard she had recently coveted in a department store and the ridiculous incongruity of this comparison in some measure restored her assurance turning her head slowly she looked at david who was properly intent on his newspaper smiled and parted her lips to speak the opening line from the gallery floated a shrill boyish squeal gee pipe the pippin the audience rocked and roared joan's heart sank then suddenly resentment kindled her temper she grew coldly furiously angry and forgot entirely to be afraid of that stupid bawling beast the public but her faint charming smile never varied a fraction turning she spoke the first line heedless of the uproar and as if magically it was stilled a feeling of contempt and superiority further encouraged her she repeated the words which were of no special value to the plot merely a trick of construction to postpone the ringing of a telephone bell long enough to let the audience grasp the relationship of those upon the stage in a respectful silence david looked up from the newspaper and replied the telephone bell rang turning to the instrument on the table beside him he lifted the receiver to his ear and the plot began to unfold david the husband in his suburban home was being called to new york on unexpected business with a client booked to sail for europe in the morning it was night reluctant to go he none the less yielded to pressure rang for the coachman and ordered a carriage in the face of the protests of joan his wife she was to be left alone in the house with her little son 
for the maids were out and the coachman slept beyond call in the stable reassuring her with his promise to return at the earliest possible moment david departed a brief and affectionate passage between the two was rendered inaudible by derisive laughter but this was almost instantly silenced when quard showed himself at a window in the back of the set peering furtively in at the lonely woman in the unguarded house an excellent actor when properly guided and fresh from the hands of one of the most astute producers connected with the american stage without uttering a word quard contrived to infuse into this first brief appearance at the window a sense of criminal and sinister mystery which instantly enchained the imagination of the audience in the tense silence of the house the nervous gasp of a high-strung woman was distinctly audible but it passed without eliciting a single hoot darting round to the door quard entered and addressed joan she cried out strongly in mingled terror and horror a few crisp and rapid lines uncovered the argument quard was the woman's first husband who had married and deserted her all in a week and whom she had been given every reason to believe dead ashamed of that mad union with a dissolute blackguard she had concealed it from the husband of her second marriage now she was confronted with the knowledge that her innocently bigamous position would be made public unless she submitted to blackmail promising in her torment to give the man all he demanded she induced him to leave before the return of the servant alone she realized suddenly the illegitimacy of the child of her second marriage at this a scene curtain fell and a notice was flashed upon it informing the audience that the short moment it remained down indicated the lapse of five hours in the action already the interests of the audience had become so fixed that it applauded with sincerity hurrying to her dressing-room joan stepped out of her pretty frock and into a negligee the removal of a few pins permitted her hair to fall down her back a long thick plaited rope of bronze then grasping a revolver loaded with blanks she ran back to the second left entrance the scene curtain was already up on the stage in semi-darkness the thief having broken into the house by way of the back window was attempting to force the combination of a small safe behind a screen quard kneeling to peer through the fireplace lifted a signalling hand to joan david stamped loudly off stage in alarm the thief hid himself behind the screen and joan came on with a line of soliloquy to indicate that she had been awakened by the noise of the burglar's entrance as she turned up the lights by means of a wall switch quard re-entered by way of the window in a well-simulated state of semi-drunkenness which had ostensibly roused his distrust and brought him back to watch and threaten his wife anew here happened one of those terrible blunders which seem almost inseparable from first performances as joan wheeled round to recognize quard her hand nervously contracted on the revolver and it exploded point-blank at quard's chest had it been loaded he must inevitably have been killed then and there and when pulling himself together quard managed to go on with the business springing upon joan and wresting the weapon from her the audience betrayed exquisite appreciation of the impossibility and shrieked and whooped with joy unrestrained it was some minutes before they were able audibly to take up the dialogue and this was fortunate in a way for the shock of that unexpected explosion had caused quard to dry up as the slang of the stage terms nervous dryness of the throat whether or not accompanied by forgetfulness he required that pandemoniac pause in which to recover and even when able to make himself heard he repeated hoarsely and with extreme difficulty the line called to him by david who was holding the prompt in the fireplace but the instinct of one bred to the stage from childhood saved him and with comparative quiet restored he braced up and played out the scene with admirable verve and technique joan was well aware that stronger though her role might be the man was giving a performance that overshadowed it heavily he was drunk and he was brutal david had telephoned that he was at the railroad station and would be home in a few minutes quard 
not content with promises insisted on money of which the woman had none to give him or her jewels which were locked away in the safe when she refused to disclose the combination or to open the safe or in besotted rage attempted to force her to open it struggling they overturned the screen exposing the thief through a breathless and silent instant the two men faced one another or bewildered the thief seeing his way of escape barred then simultaneously they fired quard using the woman's revolver one shot only took effect the thief's and that fatally quard fell joan seized the arm of the thief and urged him from the house as he vanished through the window she picked up the revolver which quard had dropped and turned to the door frantic with alarm david entered joan reeled into his arms screaming i have killed a burglar on this tableau the curtain fell and rose and fell again and again at the direction of the house manager deferring to an enthusiastic audience crude and raw as was this composition the surprise of its last line and the strength with which it was acted had won the unstinted approval of a public ever hungry for melodrama quard revivified bowing and smiling with suave and deprecatory grace joan in tears of excitement and delight and the subordinate members of the company in varying stages of gratification over the prospect of prompt booking and a long engagement were obliged to hold the stage through nine curtain calls on her way back to her dressing-room joan was halted by a touch on her shoulder she paused to recognize gloucester of whose presence in the house she had been ignorant very well done my dear he said loftily very well done you've got the makings of an actress in you if you don't lose your head now run along and dry your eyes like a good girl and don't bother me with your silly gratitude with this he brusquely turned his back to her but quard overtaking her in the gangway without hesitation or apology folded her in his arms and kissed her on the lips and joan submitted without remonstrance a thrill and elate girlie he cried exultantly you're a wonder i knew you could do it but oh my god you nearly finished me when you let that gun off right in my face somehow she found her way home alone and shut herself up in the hall bedroom to calm down and try to review the triumph sensibly unquestionably she had done well quard had done much better but no wonder she wasn't jealous she was glad for his sake as well as for her own of course this meant a great change there was to come the day of reckoning with matthias she had four letters of his not one of which she had answered if the lie got booking and she went on the road with it as she knew in her soul she would nothing now could keep her off the stage she would almost certainly lose matthias quard however would remain to her and of quard she was very sure that he loved her with genuine and generous devotion was now the one clear and indisputable fact in her unstable existence if only he would refrain from drinking he was to telephone as soon as he received any encouraging news and he had expected definite word from bosker before the afternoon was over in anticipation of being called downstairs at any minute joan remained in her street dress aching for her bed though she was with reaction and simple fatigue but it was nearly eight o'clock before she was summoned that you girlie the answer came to her breathless hello yes yes charlie what is it i've seen bosker in fact i'm eating with him now it's all settled we're to open next monday somewhere in new england springfield probably and we get forty weeks solid on top of that i'm so glad sure you are we're all glad i guess and charlie she stammered hello are you are you all right sure i'm all right good night girlie take care of yourself see you tomorrow good night said joan hooking up the receiver she leaned momentarily against the wall feeling a little faint and ill was it simply overtaxed imagination that had made her believe she detected a slight constraint in quard's voice a hesitation assumed to mask blurred enunciation End of chapter twenty three
Chapter Twenty Four of Joan Thursday by Louis Joseph Vance. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. But when Joan met Quard in the morning, her anxious eyes detected in his assured bearing none of the nervous unrest in his clear eyes and the even tone of his coarse, pasty pale skin, none of the feverish stains that are symptomatic of alcoholic excesses surprised and grateful she treated the man with a tenderness and sweetness she had otherwise been too wary to betray by thursday it was settled that they were to open on monday at polly's theatre in springfield for an engagement of a week if the audience there endorsed the verdict of the first bosker promised quard a full season's booking from the springfield house he was to receive three hundred and fifty dollars he permitted joan to understand however that his fee would be no more than the sum he had first mentioned three hundred dollars it was decided to leave new york by a sunday train which would put them down in springfield in the middle of the afternoon enabling the company to find suitable lodgings before meeting to run through their lines in the evening they would have an opportunity for a sketchy scrambly rehearsal on the stage monday morning but dared not depend on that for the greater part of their allotted period would necessarily be consumed in the selection of a practicable set from the stock of the theatre in making arrangements for suitable furniture properties and in drilling the house electrician in the uncommonly heavy schedule of light cues any one of which if bungled was calculated seriously to impair the illusion of the sketch joan thoughtfully stipulated for twenty-five dollars advance against expenses quard protested alleging financial straits due to his already heavy outlay but the girl was firm true she still had unknown to him one hundred and twenty-five dollars but not until near the end of their week at springfield would they know whether or not they were to get further booking in the end the actor ungraciously surrendered she made her preparations for leaving her hall bedroom with a craft and stealth worthy of a burglar preparing to break prison if her break with matthias was to become absolute she was determined not to leave any clue whereby she might be traced an inquiry as to the best place to take a dress to be dry cleaned furnished sufficient excuse for lugging away one well-filled suitcase which joan left at a cheap theatrical hotel a few blocks farther uptown and east of broadway where she simultaneously engaged a room for saturday night and on saturday afternoon she carried away a second suitcase containing the remainder of her wardrobe informing madame de prat that she was going to visit her folks for a day or two but first she had to undergo a bad quarter hour in the back parlor the sense of her treachery would not lift from her mood perhaps she felt its oppression the more heavily because of her uncertainty she couldn't yet be sure she wasn't committing herself to a step of irrevocable error she was only sure that she was doing what she wanted to do with all her heart whatever evil might come of it and there would be more ease in companionship with hard with him she could have her own way in everything could always be her natural self and still retain his respect and her own on the other hand she could not look up to him and was by no means as fond of him as of matthias her fiance was without reproach he loved her but his respect she could never own dimly she recognized this fact though he thought he respected her and did truly honor her as his promised wife he was his own dupe passion blinded actually they were people of different races their emotional natures differently organized their mental processes working from widely divergent views of life even in this instance joan's perception of the gulf between them was more emotional than thoughtful she moved slowly about the room resentfully distressed touching with reluctant fingers objects indelibly associated in her memory with the man of her first love sitting at his desk she enclosed in a large envelope his letters two had arrived since thursday but these she had not opened she hardly understood why she desired not to open them she still took a real and deep interest in his fortunes but she was desperately loath to read the mute reproach legible if to her eyes alone 
between his lines she meant to leave him a note of her own tenderly contrite and at the same time firmly final but in spite of a mood saturated with an appropriately gentle and generous melancholy she could not apparently fix it down with ink on paper eventually she gave it up destroyed what she had attempted and sealed the packet leaving matthias no written word of hers save his name on the face of the envelope there remained the most difficult duty of all with painful reluctance joan removed the ring from her finger where it had been ever since she had last parted with quard and replacing it in its leather-covered case sat for a long time looking her farewell upon that brilliant and more than intrinsically precious jewel at length closing the case she placed it on top of the envelope rose and moved to the door there she hesitated looking back in pain and longing there was no telling what might happen to it before matthias returned a prying chambermaid and then it was quite possible that the lie would not last out the week in springfield quard had more than once pointed out there's nothing sure in this game but the fact that you're bound to close sooner than you look for maybe i'll be back inside a week joan doubted there's always that chance and she had already left one door open against her return anyway it isn't safe there and i can mail it to him registered when i'm sure he's home turning back she snatched up the leather case and darted guiltily from the study and out of the house End of chapter 24chapter twenty five of joan thursday by lewis joseph vance this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard the stage wise have long since learned to discount a slump in the next performance to follow a brilliantly successful premiere the phenomenon is as inevitable as poor food on a route of one night stands at springfield on monday afternoon the lie was presented in a manner of unpardonable crudity quard forgot his lines and extemporized and gagged desperately to cover the consequent breaks in the dialogue leaving poor joan hopelessly at sea floundering for cues that were never uttered at the last moment it was discovered that nothing had been provided to simulate at the beginning of the second scene the sound of a clock striking twelve off stage the property man could offer nothing better than an iron crowbar and a hammer the twelve strokes consequently resembled nothing in the world other than a wholly untemperamental crowbar banged by a dispassionate hammer fortunately the effect was so thin and dead that it convulsed only the first few rows of the orchestra the light cues went wrong when they were not altogether ignored and once when joan having indicated in a brief soliloquy her depression on being left alone in the gloomy house gave the cue i must have more light at the same time touching a property switch on the wall every light in the house other than the red exit lamps was blacked out and at all other times the required changes either anticipated or dragged far behind their cues the thief forgot to load his revolver with the result that quard fired the only shot in their duel and then fell dead this so rattled david that he anticipated his first entrance and rushed on the stage only to back off precipitately while joan was urging the thief to go and leave her to shoulder his crime the only misadventure that failed to attend upon the performance was a traditional one of the stage the theatre cat by some accident did not walk upon the scene at a climax and seat itself before the footlights to wash its face nevertheless the sketch got over at the matinee receiving three curtain calls and at night when the little company conscious of its crimes pulled itself together and acted with an intensity of effort only equalled by that of its first performance in new york the house gave the piece a rousing reception thereafter they played it well and consistently with increasing assurance as days passed and use bred the habit in them all on thursday quard heard from boskirk and announced that the company would return to new york the following monday to play a six weeks engagement in the percy williams houses 
beginning with a fortnight in manhattan and winding up in greenpoint long island he added that bostrick was busy arranging a subsequent tour which would take them to the pacific coast and back he did not add that the agent had successfully demanded as much as four hundred and fifty dollars a week for the offering from many of the more prosperous houses on their list from which figure the price ranged down to as little as three hundred in some of the smaller inland towns but even at this minimum quard had so scaled his salary list contrary to his representations to joan that his gross weekly profit excluding personal living expenses would seldom be less than one hundred dollars a week back in new york joan established herself temporarily at a small and very poor hotel on the west side of harlem since their engagement took her no farther south than sixty-third street and broadway during its first week and the second week was played at one hundred and twenty-sixth street and seventh avenue she felt tolerably insured against meeting either matthias or any member of her own family she really meant to go home some time and see how her mother and edna were doing but from day to day put it off if with no better excuse on the ground that she was too tired and too busy as a matter of fact she was in the habit of waking up at about ten but never rose until noon spent the hours between three and four and nine and ten in the theatre and was ordinarily in bed by half past twelve or one o'clock up to the matinee hour and between that and the night she managed without great difficulty to kill time spending a deal of it and a fair proportion of her earnings in the uptown department stores she dined with quard quite frequently and almost invariably after the last performance they supped together often in company with friends of his for the most part vaudeville people whom he had previously known or with whom he struck up fervent facile friendships of a week's duration they were a quaint scandalous crew feather-brained irresponsible and most of them destitute of any sort of originality but their spirits were high as long as they had a payday ahead their tongues were quick with the patter of the circuits and their humour was of an order new and vastly diverting to joan she had with them what she called a good time and soon learned to look leniently upon the irregular lives of some who entertained her once or twice she was invited to parties sociable gatherings in flats rented furnished at which she learned to regard the consumption of large quantities of bottled beer as a polite and even humorous accomplishment and to permit a degree of freedom in song and joke and innuendo that would have seemed impossible in another environment probably she would have felt less tolerant of these matters had quard betrayed the least tendency to fall off the wagon but in her company at least he refrained sedulously from drink and since his was one of those constitutions whose normal vitality is so high and constant that alcohol benumbs rather than stimulates its functions he shone the more by contrast with their occasionally befuddled companions joan admired him intensely for the steadfastness of his stand and still more when she saw how established was the habit of regular if not always heavy drinking in the world of their peers no one but herself pretended for a moment to regard the reformation of quard as anything but a fugitive whim and now and again she was made aware that his abstinence was resented she once heard him contemptuously advise to chuck the halo and kick in and get human again and another time he explained a false excuse given in her presence for refusing an invitation it's no use trying to travel with that gang unless you're boozing they got no use for me unless i'm willing to get an edge on what's the use there was a surliness a resentment underlying his tone intuitively joan bristled no use she said sharply you know what you're up against better than they do you've got to stick to the soft stuff if you want to keep going oh i know he grumbled but it ain't as easy as you'd think all right she retorted calmly but i give you fair warning i'll quit you the very first time you come around with so much as a whiff of the stuff on you you don't have to worry he responded i'm on all right but he added abruptly 
you needn't run away with any notion this piece would head for the storehouse if you was to quit it the woods are full of girls who jump at your chance joan answered only with an enigmatic smile it is doubtful if cord himself realized just then as keenly as the girl did the depth and strength of his infatuation but joan did not doubt her power neither did she overestimate it it was toward the end of their time in new york that she learned of the failure of the jade god the information coming to her through the medium of one of those coincidences which would be singular anywhere but on the stage an actress in a farcical sketch which followed the intermission preceded by the lie was assigned to use joan's dressing-room when the latter was through with it naturally the two struck up a chatting acquaintance joan one time replied to a question with the information that the lie was booked for the pacific coast and matthias in mind confessed to some curiosity regarding los angeles the other actress admitted ignorance of the west but had only that morning received a letter from a sister who was playing with the algerson stock company in los angeles the letter contained a clipping describing the immediate and disastrous collapse of the jade god which had been withdrawn after its third repetition reading the review joan was puzzled to recognize some of its references she was fairly familiar with the play but here and there she encountered strictures which seemed to involve scenes she couldn't remember but of the fact of the failure there could be no doubt she was genuinely sorry her first impulse was to seek matthias if he were in town and tell him of her sympathy her second discarded with even less ceremony than the first to write to him two things held her back sheer moral cowardice that would not let her face the man whom she had failed even as had his play and the impossibility of explaining that she loved the stage more than him or anything else in the world except his ring and while she never faltered from meaning to return this last before long she could not yet bring herself to part with it always it was with her on her finger when at home and alone in her pocket-book when abroad or with quard still in her imagination retaining something of its vaguely talismanic virtue standing to her for something fanciful and magic which she could not name a visible token of mystical powers that worked for her good fortune it was mid-october sweetest of all seasons in new york a time of early evenings and long clear gloamings beneath skies of exquisite suavity and depth of crisp and heady days whose air is wine in a crystal chalice when thoughts are long and sweet gentle with the beauty and the sadness of aging autumn at the first hint of winter joan's heart turned in longing to the thought of furs she wasted hours studying advertisements and many more going from place to place examining rejecting coveting her fancy was not modest a year ago she would have been delighted with the meanest strip of squirrel for a neckpiece to-day she felt a little ashamed even to price the less expensive furs and would make no attempt to purchase until she had saved up enough money to meet her desires and then one morning they were playing at the orpheum theatre in brooklyn a messenger brought her a package from one of the fulton street stores and required a signed receipt it contained a handsome coat of imitation seal with a collar of rich black fur and lined with golden brocade fitting her perfectly it enclosed her in generous warmth from throat to ankle accompanying it was the card of mr charles harborough quard presenting the lie the sketch sensation of the year address c o jas k bosker st james building new york not since that day when she had received his ring from matthias had she been so happy meeting quard in the gangway outside her dressing-room before the matinee performance she showed her gratitude by lifting her face for his kiss in the world in which they existed kisses were commonplaces quite perfunctory of little more significance than a slap on the shoulder between acquaintances not so jones she had set a value upon her caresses a standard peculiarly inflexible with respect to cord none the less this was not the second time he had known her lips but the occasion was one rare enough to render him appreciative he wound an arm round her and held her tight 
like it eh girlie i love it then i'm satisfied but how did you guess what i wanted most maybe i did a little headwork to find out it's dear of you so long as you think so i've got no kick coming she disengaged drew a pace or two away but what made you do it charlie well i can't afford to have my leading lady out of the cast with a cold joan shook her head at him in gay reproof or do you want me to tell you what you know already that i'm crazy about you foolish it's time we were dressing but her laugh was fond and so was the look she threw over her shoulder as she evaded his arms and vanished into her dressing-room quard lingered a moment with a fatuous smile for the panels of the closed door and wagged his head doggishly he felt that he was winning ground at a famous rate the difficulties the coolness and craft of his antagonist considered and in a way he was right though perhaps not precisely the way he had in mind even before his princely gift joan had been thinking a great deal about him and very seriously instinctively she foresaw that their relationship could not long continue on its present basis of simple good fellowship quard wasn't the sort to be content at arm's length he must either come closer or go farther away and might be dependent upon not to adopt the latter course until the former had proved impracticable and joan didn't want him to go farther away she was positive about this but she was also very sure that the arm's length relationship must be abridged only under certain indispensable conditions decorously and soon if at all else she must be the one to withdraw lest a worse thing befall her it was a problem of two factors quard's nature and her own she had herself to reckon with no less than with him and herself she distrusted who was no stronger than her greatest weakness he attracted her she often caught herself thinking of him as she had thought of no other man not matthias not the quard of the convict's return not even marbridge except perhaps for one shameful instant something in the lawless ranging wanton grain of this man called to her with a call of infinite allure something latent in her thrilled to the call and answered that way lurked danger disguised but deadly they moved on to greenpoint thence to trenton for a week daily quard's attentions became more constant intimate and tender they were much together and now far more exclusively together than had been possible in new york where acquaintances commandeered so much of their time in trenton they lodged at the same hotel the other members of the company finding cheaper accommodations at greater distance from the theatre this increased their close and confidential association they fell into the habit of breakfasting together quard always first to rise would telephone to joan's room ascertain how soon she would be dressed and order for both of them accordingly in return for this privilege he had that of paying for both meals a negro waiter spoke of joan one morning in her presence as the missus when he had retired out of earshot their eyes sought one another's constraint was swept away in laughter we might as well be married the way we're together all the time quard presently ventured oh i don't know about that joan retorted pertly i mean the way other people see us i shouldn't be surprised if everybody in the hotel thought we was married girlie joan colored faintly well the room clerk knows better she said definitely i'd like another cup of coffee please quard snapped his fingers loudly to attract the attention of the waiter he grew aware of an awkward silence that the thoughts of both were converging to a common point folks are fools that get married in the profession he observed consciously it's all right if you got a husband or i've got a wife at home i don't see it joan interrupted smartly anyway i haven't have you the actor stared confused have i what got a wife at home joan repeated laughing no nothing like that he asserted with intense earnestness i mean it's all right if you've got somebody keeping a flat warm for you some place not too far off broadway 
but if you marry into the business good night you got all the trouble of being tied up for life and that's all why managers don't want husband and wife in the same company they're always fighting each other's battles when they ain't fighting between themselves so you're always playing different routes and the chances are they never cross except it's inconvenient and you get caught and nominated for the alimony club do you belong didn't i just tell you nothing like that quard protested with unnecessary heat well john murmured mischievously you seem to know so much about it i only wondered their place on the bill was near the end that week a trip bicyclist followed them and moving pictures wound up the performance consequently by the time they were able to leave the theatre in the afternoon the sun was already below the horizon they emerged the same evening from the stage door to view a cloudless sky of pulsing amber shading into purple at the zenith melting into rose along the western rim of the world a wash of old rose flooded the streets lifting the meanest structures out of their ugliness lending an added dignity to rows of square-set old-fashioned residences of red brick with white marble trimmings which way are you going quard inquired as they approached the corner of a main thoroughfare back to the hotel no i'm sick of that hole joan replied with a vivid shudder i'm going to take a walk want to come i was just going to ask you they turned off toward the delaware it was the twenty-first of november winter still a month away yet the breath of winter was in the air it came up cool and brisk from the river enriching the colour in joan's cheeks that were bright and glowing from the scrubbing she always gave them after removing grease paint with cold cream the blood coursed tingling through her veins her eyes shone with deepened lustre they walked with spirit in step in a pensive silence and frequently disturbed of course quard presently offered without preface it's different in vaudeville if you stick to it what's different being married joan's eyes widened momentarily then she laughed outright gee you don't mean to say you've been chewing that rag ever since breakfast ah uh, i just happened to think of it again said quard with the air of one whose motives are wantonly misconstrued nevertheless he wouldn't let the subject languish there's plenty of family acts been playing the servants god knows how long he pursued with a vast display of interest in the sunset glow look at the cohans before george planted the american flag in longacre square and annexed it to the united states and they ain't the only ones by a long shot i could name a plenty that'll stick in the big time until their toes curl it's all right to trot in double harness so long as you manage your own company well joan asked with a sober mouth and mischievous eyes well what if you're getting ready to slip me my two weeks notice why not be a man and say so what would i do that for quard demanded indignantly because you're thinking about getting married and there's only room for one leading lady in any company i play in quit your kidding the man advised sulkily you know i couldn't get along without you yes joan admitted calmly i know it but i didn't know you did quard shot a suspicious glance askance but her face was immobile in its flawless loveliness he started to say something choked up and reconsidered with a painful frown a mature man's perfect freedom is not likely to be thrown away and yet he doubted darkly the perfection of his freedom they held on in silence until they came to riverside park over the dark profile of the pennsylvania hills the sky was jade and amethyst a pool of light that dwindled swiftly in the thickening shades of violet below them as they paused on a lonely walk the river stole swiftly like a great black serpent writhing through the shadows a frosty wind swept steadily into their faces making cool and firm the flesh flushed with exercise there was no one near them a train of jeweled lights swept over the railroad bridge and vanished into the night with a purring rumble that lent an accent to their isolation 
joan hugged about her voluptuously her wonderful coat stole a glance warm with gratitude at the face of quard he intercepted it and edged nearer aglow and eager she murmured something vapid about the prettiness of the sky he answered only with the arm he passed about her she suffered him lashes veiling her eyes her head at rest in the hollow of his shoulder the man stared down at her exquisite suffused face luminous in the last light of gloaming joan he said throatily girlie don't you love me a little her mouth grew tremulous i don't know she whispered i love you he cried suddenly in an exultant voice i love you he folded her unresisting in both his arms covering her face with kisses ardent violent kisses that bruised and hurt her tender flesh but which she still sought and hungered for insatiable she sobbed a little in her happiness feeling her body yield and yearn to his transported by that sweet exquisite nameless longing then suddenly she was like a steel spring in his embrace writhing to free herself wondering he tried to hold her closer but she twisted and fended him off with all the power of her strong young arms and still wondering he humoured her she drew away but yet not wholly out of his clasp charlie she panted darling how do you get married in new jersey he pulled up dashed and a little disappointed and laughed nervously why you get a license and then well almost anybody'll do to tie the knot she nodded tensely i guess a regular minister will be good enough for us i guess so he demurred and with another laugh i wasn't thinking serious about it but i guess i might as well be married as the way i am well she said quietly we've got to it's the only way End of chapter twenty five